Hello, and welcome to another podcast from Dr. Crunch. My name's Viral. And I'm Sheena. And today, we're going to talk about chronic diarrhoea. Hey, Lois. What? Diarrhoea. <laughs> okay, but what is chronic diarrhoea? The definition of diarrhoea is if you have a loose, voluminous stool. So that's more than 200 grams per day. And we call it chronic if it lasts for more than four weeks. So when we're thinking about the causes, how can you differentiate it from acute diarrhoea? Acute diarrhoea generally is going to be infectious in origin, whereas chronic diarrhoea, you know, if it's been there for four weeks, it's much less likely to be uh, an acute infection. It's much more likely to be either a systemic disease or perhaps a functional disease. So, Sheena, what are the causes of a chronic diarrhoea? If you want to know a quick and memorable answer to sort of throw out in, in OSCEs, you can think about the five Cs. These are Crohn's, celiacs, cancer chronic pancreatitis and chronic infections. What are the key features on a history that you'd want for chronic diarrhoea? Basically, you are just trying to distinguish between a functional and an organic cause. One. Distinguish between an inflammatory, secretory and malabsorptive cause. Two. And then to really knuckle down to a specific diagnosis. Three. So tell us, Viral, about the organic causes. According to gut.bmj.com, uh, with the, from the British Society of Gastroenterologists, uh, symptoms that would be suggestive of an organic disease include a history of diarrhea of less than three months duration, predominantly nocturnal or continuous diarrhea, and significant weight loss. It's also worth being aware of the cancer referral guidelines. Uh, so this would include people who are 40 years or, o- or over with rectal bleeding and a change in uh, stool frequency or change of bowel habits towards looser stools for six weeks or more. It would also include people over 60 with just the change in bowel habits. It also includes anyone with a right-sided lower abdominal mass, uh, anyone with a palpable rectal mass, uh, and any men with an unexplained iron deficiency anemia of less than 11 grams uh, per DL, or any non-menstruating women with an unexplained anemia of 10 grams per DL. So criteria which would make you more suspicious of a functional etiology would be the Rome criteria, or you could use the uh, NICE criteria for IBS. So this can be remembered as having a six-month history of ABC, where A is abdominal pain or discomfort, B is bloating, and C is a change in bowel habits. And then you'd consider positively diagnosing IBS if the abdominal pain is either relieved by defecation or associated with altered bowel frequency or stool form. You also need two of the following, and I remember it as ASP, so like a little coming out the ass. Um, So A stands for abdominal bloating. S stands for stool, which has an altered passage. So, you know, straining, urgency, or incomplete evacuation. S stands for symptoms aggravated by eating. And P is a passage of mucus rectally. So, Sheena, how would you distinguish a malabsorptive type of diarrhea from the other types? Patients classically complain of um, steatorrhea. So they basically say that their stools are hard to flush away and that, and that they float. As quoted by the, um, the British Society of Gastroenterologists, they say that malabsorption is often accompanied by steatorrhea and the passage of bulky, malodorous, pale stools. However, milder forms of malabsorption may not result in any reported stool abnormality. Colonic, inflammatory or secretory forms of diarrhoea typically present with liquid, loose stools with blood or mucus discharge. Inspection of the stool may be helpful in distinguishing these two. So, let's go down the causes of uh, chronic diarrhoea, see if there's some kind of system we can use to help it make it more memorable. Uh, You can go down it by anatomy. So, uh, starting at the top, you get things like small bowel and pancreas, and when these guys get affected, you tend to get malabsorption. Going down, uh, you get the colon, and when that's... um, affected, you get a sort of more secretory inflammatory type of problem. And then you have your systemic causes. So these would be kind of endocrine problems or maybe drugs and in particular antibiotics. Okay, so let's go down the small bowel first. And generally the malabsorptive guys tend to begin with C. Uh, so celiac disease, uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, then you also get disaccharide deficiency, so things like lactose intolerance. Uh, You can also get uh, the rare things like whipples and tropical sprue, but I wouldn't really focus on those too much. The other two probably worth keeping in the back of your mind would be lymphomas and a chronic infection like Giardia. Moving along, you get the pancreas, and when this guy gets affected, um, as in chronic pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis, you'll get a malabsorptive diarrhea. So the more four C's of uh, malabsorption, just to reiterate, would be celiac disease, Crohn's disease, chronic pancreatitis and cystic fibrosis. 
And down the colonic route, we're thinking mainly about neoplasias, UC and Crohn's. So then there are the endocrine systemic ones, such as hypothyroidism, diabetes causing an autonomic neuropathy, Addison's disease, and then the rarer ones, such as the gastronomas and carcinoid tumours. And then you get the other causes, uh, most commonly drug-induced, in particular antibiotics. Now, antibiotics uh, induce diarrhoea through three main mechanisms. The first one is an os- osmotic mechanism. So you take an oral antibiotic, you wipe out a lot of the gut flora, uh, and as a result, those bacteria aren't absorbing as much carbohydrate as they normally would. And as a result, you've got more carbohydrates sitting in the lumen of the intestine, and it's almost like you've given them a dose of lactulose, so you've now created uh, an osmotic diarrhoea. And patients at particular high risk of antibiotic-induced diarrhoea from this mechanism are those on enteral nutrition, which has a high uh, carbohydrate load. Then, of course, you have um, the prokinetic causes. So erythromycin in particular, it's a prokinetic uh, drug, so it's going to create diarrhoea. And finally, we have the one you're all thinking about, which is C. diff-induced. Uh, and uh, there's actually been a change in the approach to how C. diff orig- uh, is caused. We used to think that we have asymptomatic carriers and then we give them an antibiotic and that wipes out uh, the normal flora and so C. diff proliferates. But this doesn't explain why C. diff is more common in hospitalised environments, because surely if you gave these antibiotics in the community, you'd be um, causing outbreaks of C. diff everywhere. We now believe there's a three-hit hypothesis to C. diff. So you need the first insult, okay, which is going to be something like a, an antibiotic. You then need to have C. diff uh, C. diff infection. So this is why it spreads in the hospital so much. It needs to actually be spread from somewhere to you. And then thirdly, you need a weakened immune system or a particularly virulent C. diff to actually give you the syndrome. And the majority of people who pick up C. diff will be asymptomatic. And so it's only really the immunosuppressed or a particularly evil version of C. diff that causes real problems. Okay, so how would you actually investigate some chronic diarrhea? Well, obviously start with your basic blood. So this includes FBCs, LFTs, calcium B12, folate, iron status, thyroid function, celiac serology, and of course, use and ease. Um, so you're basically looking for evidence of malabsorption by doing these floods and also seeing um, what the effect of the diarrhea is having by looking at the hydration status in the use and ease. Okay, and then the next step uh, would be to distinguish, is it, does it sound like organic or does it sound like a functional thing? We've already spoken about the kind of things that help us distinguish between the two. Now, if the patient is less than 45 and has symptoms suggestive of a functional disease, and has normal basic investigations. The British Society of Gastroenterologists say you can pretty much treat that as irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, However, if there's any symptoms of organic diarrhea or there's abnormal basic investigations, then you wanna hunt down that cause. So now we're gonna split them into their malabsorptive causes and the other ones. Okay, so the malabsorptive ones we mentioned earlier, generally things arising from the small bowel and the pancreas. And the small bowel things we're thinking about, uh, particularly CDAX disease, uh, uh, you've already screened for, hopefully, in your basic investigations. If it comes back positive, you might want to do, well, you probably will want to do a duodenal biopsy. Um, you can also do a barium swallow th- uh, follow-through, which is really good for identifying malabsorptive uh, pathologies. In terms of your pancreas, um, you can use a CT pancreas uh, to kind of uh, pick up some chronic pancreatitis. More simply, a fecal elastase. Uh, it's a bit less invasive and obviously doesn't have the radiation dose. And if you're suspecting Crohn's disease, first line now is ileocolonoscopy. Okay, and if you're thinking of a colonic type problem, and it's been chronic, then generally you're going to investigate with some sort of oscopy. The patient's less than 45, generally a flexi-sig would be used. If they're over 5, you might want to go for a colonoscopy to investigate things a bit more thoroughly. Um, you may want to use a colonoscopy if you're querying UC, if you want to also establish the extent of the disease. So that's all from us now. If you want any more information on this topic, go to the British Society of Gastroenterology website, or of course, visit Dr. Crunch. Dr. Crunch. Thank you very much.